laying the groundwork for disputing the election results. The only way we're going to lose this election is if the election is rigged. Remember that. Trailing Democratic nominee Joe Biden in the poll. But remember, he doesn't lose. He's only cheated out of things. And yes, he is already laying the groundwork to make that exact argument if he comes out on the uh, not winning side in November. And here's how. In late May, Trump tweeted this, quote, there is no way, zero, that mail-in ballots will be anything less than substantially fraudulent. Mailboxes will be robbed, ballots will be forged, and even illegally printed out and fraudulently signed. The governor of California is sending ballots to millions of people. Anyone living in the state, no matter who they are or how they got there, We'll get one. That will be followed up with professionals telling all of these people, many of whom have never even thought of voting before, how and for whom to vote. This will be a rigged election. No way! End quote. <laughs> no, right. No, not normal. And at his golf club here in New Jersey, gearing up for a contentious election where the battle over mail and voting is taking center stage. Less than 80 days out from Election Day, the battle over mail-in voting intensifying. President Trump launching a new round of attacks, calling it a disgrace. Universal mail-in voting is going to be catastrophic. It's going to make our country a laughing stock all over the world. Democrats calling on the new Postmaster General, Louis DeJoy, to resign. Congressman Adam Schiff tweeting, he's slow delivery, banned overtime, and decommissioned mail sorting machines right before the election during a pandemic. Within this administration is an attempt to make sure your vote doesn't count and doesn't count as cast. DeJoy, a GOP donor, was tapped by President Trump to take the job at the post office, now under fire for cost-cutting measures that have slowed mail delivery nationwide. The president coming to his defense. I don't know, I don't know what he's doing. I can only tell you he's a very smart man. An embarrassment to our country. We were getting ready to win this election. Frankly, we did win this election. We did win this election. So our goal now is to ensure the integrity for the good of this nation. This is a very big moment. This is a major fraud in our nation. We want the law to be used in a proper manner. So we'll be going to the U.S. Supreme Court. We want all voting to stop. We don't want them to find any ballots at 4 o'clock in the morning and add them to the list, okay? It's, it's a very sad, it's a very sad moment. To me, this is a very sad moment, and we will win this, and we, as far as I'm concerned, we already have won it. So I just want to thank you. Today, I have strongly recommended to every governor to deploy the National Guard in sufficient numbers that we dominate the streets. Let me be clear. Uh, the president just used a Bible, the most sacred text of the Judeo Christian tradition, and one of the churches of my diocese without permission as a backdrop for a message antithetical to the teachings of Jesus and everything that our churches stand for. And to do so, as you just said, he sanctioned the use of tear gas 
by police officers in riot gear to clear the churchyard. I am outraged. For his role in Trump's photo op last week at St. John's Church, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Mark Milley, said publicly today that it was a mistake. I should not have been there. My presence in that moment and in that environment created a perception of the military involved in domestic politics. As a commissioned uniformed officer, it was a mistake that I've learned from, and I sincerely hope we all can learn from it. NBC News is reporting tonight that Milley's apology comes after he discussed resigning over the episode. Trump, on the other hand, is still defending the use of the National Guard on those peaceful protesters to make way for his photo op. Today, boasting that those troops, quote, could not believe how easy it was to clear Lafayette Park and warbling about the protesters, agitators, anarchists, and his favorite boogeyman, Antifa, all in the same tweet. Also in that tweet, Trump referred to the U.S. Secret Service as the SS, an abbreviation that's never used to refer to that agency, and for very good reason. We now also know that Trump actually wanted to order active duty troops to the streets of D.C. and that he almost fired his defense secretary for opposing that move. So what are you hearing uh, that caused Milley to speak out again? And I say again, it's almost we, we know what they did last week. But, uh, you know, we could go through about seven days in a row here where some high member of the military has tried to do something to basically uh, assuage the protest movement. Yeah, that's right. I mean, we know what was happening last week where we had military leaders from the Pentagon and from the National Guard who were working behind the scenes, desperately trying to get National Guard soldiers into D.C. and National Guard troops around the country in an effort to keep President Trump from invoking the Insurrection Act. That was one thing that was very clear by late in the week, week and that was the military, both the civilian and the uniformed leadership did not want the Insurrection Act. General Milley, his decision to come forward with and, and speak out today in this in this pre-taped message to National Defense University, though, but he is not immune to the criticism that he was receiving for being for being with the president when that photo op happened at St. John's Church more than a week ago. There was criticism on social media, in the press. There were retired generals and admirals. People were speaking out about the fact that the military was being pulled into politics. And I can tell you, uh, you know, after covering the Pentagon for 15 years and being through a number of chairman of the Joint Chiefs, that's something that many of them hold as sacrosanct. The fact that the uniform military leadership are not supposed to be dragged into politics. We heard about it all the time from Millie's predecessor. I am your warrior. I am your justice. And for those who have been wronged and betrayed, I am your retribution. I am your retribution. That's almost what I call gangster-type politics. The politics of retribution, politics of revenge. Fox News wound up paying 787 and a half million US dollars in a settlement uh, to get out of it. That tells you all, you all you need to know about how credible those claims were. He'd fired the warning shots that he wouldn't go down without a fight. If you count the legal votes, I easily win. If you count the illegal votes, they can try to steal the election from us. A sitting president in the White House undermining his country's election process. This is a case where they're trying to steal an election 
They're trying to rig an election. Hurling unfounded widespread allegations. We'll not allow the corruption to steal such an important election or any election for that matter. And uh, we can't allow silence, anybody to silence our voters and manufacture results. His target, the mail-in vote, millions of them in a pandemic election. We were winning in all the key locations by a lot, actually. And then our numbers started miraculously getting whittled away in secret. We were up by nearly 700,000 votes in Pennsylvania. In Georgia, I won by a lot. States still counting all day. The changing numbers left to his own party to explain. In Pennsylvania, Democrats voted by mail and Republicans voted by uh, in, in person. It's because you asked them to do so. Democrats voted by mail. That's why that's why your lead went away. Major American networks cut off the primetime speech. And we have to interrupt here because the president has uh, made a number of uh, false statements, including the notion that there has been fraudulent voting. And we're not going to allow it to keep going because it's not true. David, there is simply no evidence that has been presented. He is trying to plan an alternate route to retain the White House. He laid the groundwork. claimed it was, quote, statistically impossible to have lost the 2020 election before calling for a big protest in D.C. on January 6th. Be there will be wild. Trump supporters responded immediately. Women for America First, a pro-Trump organizing group, had previously applied for a rally permit for January 22nd and 23rd in Washington, D.C., several days after Joe Biden was to be inaugurated. But in the hours after the tweet, they moved their permit to January 6th, two weeks before. This rescheduling created the rally where Trump would eventually speak. The next day, Ali Alexander, leader of the Stop the Steal organization and a key mobilizer of Trump supporters, registered wildprotest.com, named after Trump's tweet. Wildprotest.com provided comprehensive information about numerous newly organized protest events in Washington. It in December 19th, the year is 2020, and one of the most historic events in American history has just taken place. President Trump, in the early morning hours today, tweeted that he wants the American people to march on Washington, D.C. on January 6, 2021. Who hides evidence? Criminals hide evidence, not honest people. So over the next 10 days, we get to see the machines that are crooked, the ballots that are fraudulent, and if we're wrong, we will be made fools of. But if we're right, a lot of them will go to jail. So, let's have trial by combat. All of us here today do not want to see our election victory stolen by emboldened radical left Democrats, which is what they're doing, and stolen by the fake news media. That's what they've done and what they're doing. We will never give up. We will never concede. It doesn't happen. You don't concede when there's theft involved. Our country has had enough. We will not take it anymore. And that's what this is all about. And to use a favorite term that all of you people really came up with, we will stop the steal. We have come to demand that Congress do the right thing and only count the electors who have been lawfully slated, lawfully slated. I know that everyone here will soon be marching over to the Capitol building. 
to peacefully and patriotically make your voices heard. Today, we will see whether Republicans stand strong for integrity of our elections, but whether or not they stand strong for our country. Our country. Our country has been under siege for a long time. You don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. We're going to the Capitol, and we're going to try and give our Republicans the weak ones, because the strong ones don't need any of our help. We're tr going to try and give them the kind of pride and boldness that they need to take back our country. And to use a favorite term that all of you people really came up with, we will stop the steal. At a rally near the White House, President Trump spoke to a crowd estimated in the thousands, everyone from ordinary Americans to conspiracy theorists boys. to members of right-wing extremist groups. We will never give up. We will never concede. It Trump repeated happen. the lie that the election was stolen, urging his supporters to march to the Capitol and fight. You'll never take back our country with weakness. We fight like hell. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. Around 1 p.m., as Trump is wrapping up his remarks in the park, the day turned violent. A group of his supporters on the western side of the Capitol confront the handful of police guarding the barriers and force their way. Soon after, the mob was rampaging through the halls of the Capitol. From what we saw on Wednesday, the MAGA anger is at a new level. And with Trump now banned from Twitter, and plans already circulating for future marches on the Capitol, yeah! Yeah! that day of unprecedented violence may not be the end of this unrest. We have a breach of the Capitol! Breach of the Capitol! For the January 6th committee, a crucial question. What exactly was our commander in chief doing during the hours of violence? Today, we address precisely that issue. And I now recognize the gentlewoman from Virginia. From the time when President Trump ended his speech until the moment when he finally told the mob to go home, a span of 187 minutes, more than three hours, what you will learn is that so Elaine, Laurie, and I decided to, to lead the 187-minute hearing because we were both veterans on the committee. Elaine and I had taken the oath twice as a member of Congress and as a military member. And I think it was important for us to just hopefully express that outrage of how there are people that are willing to die for this country, and this guy couldn't even follow through on his basic oath to defend the constitutional branch of government. Here's what will be clear by the end of this hearing. President Trump did not fail to act during the 187 minutes between leaving the ellipse and telling the mob to go home. He chose not to act. The 187 minutes began as Trump left the stage. 
and demanded that his motorcade drive him to the Capitol. The president was still adamant to go to the Capitol, but his Secret Service detail was equally determined to not let him go. That led to a heated argument with the detail that delayed the departure of the motorcade to the White House. Later, Cassidy Hutchinson heard reports about what happened. So once the president had gotten into the vehicle with Bobby Angle, who was the head of Mr. Trump's security detail, he thought that they were going up to the Capitol. And when Bobby had relayed to him, we're not, we don't have the assets to do it. It's not secure. We're going back to the West Wing. The president had very strong, a very angry response to that. The president said something to the effect of, I'm the effing president, take me up to the Capitol now. To which Bobby responded, sir, we have to go back to the West Wing. He saw this crowd and he wanted to participate in some manner, whether it was leading the crowd or being part of the crowd or, or going, but certainly there was a level of frustration when he was told that he couldn't, that he was so focused on disrupting the joint session that day, he himself wanted to go. When he couldn't go to the Capitol with the crowd, the president returned to the White House. In some ways, the most telling portrayal of the president and his intent here is not what happens in the lead up to the attack on the Capitol, but what he does or doesn't do when it's taking place and in the aftermath of it. President Trump went to the private dining room off the Oval Office. Witnesses told us that on January 6th, President Trump sat in his usual spot at the head of the table facing a television hanging on the wall. We know from the employee that the TV was tuned to Fox News all afternoon. This is real. It's happening on Capitol Hill. We're trying to get some ground truth to exactly what's happening on the ground. Uh, to your point broadly, this He's in that little private dining room off the Oval Office. The TV is on. He's watching it take place. He knows what's happening. He understands what's happening. And his instinct is to, in effect, egg them on. At 1.49, he tweeted out a link to the recording of his ellipse speech. This was the same speech in which he knowingly sent an armed mob to the Capitol. But President Trump made no comment about the lawlessness and the violence. They are locking down the Capitol complex. No one is allowed in or out. Now, just a few moments. The White House is just in shock. Many of them testified that they tried to get the president to take some sort of action to get the crowd to leave the Capitol. White House counsel Pat Cipollone was one of Trump's advisors urging action. I think I was pretty clear there needed to be an immediate and forceful response statement, public statement, that people need to leave the Capitol now. Did you continue, Mr. Cipollone, to push for a stronger state? Yes. Were you joined in that effort? by Ivanka Trump, yes. by Eric Hershey, yes. by Mark Meadows. Yes. These aides and lawyers rushing into this private dining room, trying to get him to do something, trying to get him to speak out, trying to get him to stop the attack, and he won't do it. He was enjoying this. These were his people. He loved them. And they were accomplishing something that he wanted to have accomplished, which was to delay and derail the certification of this election. The committee saw it as evidence of what the president had been planning all along. It says volumes about the president's intent. It suggests that the president is reluctant to call this off, that he sees his people fighting as a potentially positive thing. His own daughter is encouraging him to more forcefully stop the violence. And the fact that he does not, for hours after being aware of the violence, tell people to go home, really, really powerful evidence of his intent. Now, look at what you've got now. You have protesters inside the Capitol building. The other big question is, where is the vice president? Oh, 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 o
the Secret Service rushed Pence away from the crowd. If we lose uh, any more time, we may have, we may lose the ability to, to leave. With the Capitol overrun, the president fired off a tweet about his vice president. Mike Pence didn't have the courage to do what should have been done to protect our country. country and our constitution. Is that true? I didn't I'm, hear, I'm hearing no. reports that Pence caved. No I'm way. telling you, if Pence caved, we're going to drag mother through the streets. As that tweet goes out at 2.24 p.m., his supporters see it, and there is an intense surge uh, in the rioting. A tweet threw fuel on the fire. mob goes down there to the Capitol and chants, hang Mike Pence. And they actually build a gallows out in front of the Capitol. I mean, they, they meant it. I can only imagine what Mike Pence must have thought when the full weight of the betrayal must have become so palpable for him, when he must have thought, it has come to this that the one moment as vice president where I have stood on principle, I am being treated as the enemy and they've come for me and the president is attacking me. Not only is he not calling to say, are you okay? Uh, he's egging it on. Uh, it's, it, is, it, is an, it is an amazing moment. At the White House, Pat Cipollone was growing concerned for the vice president. I remember Pat saying, Mark, we need to do something more. They're literally calling for the vice president to be effing hung. And Mark had responded something to the effect of, you heard him, Pat. He thinks Mike deserves it. He doesn't think they're doing anything wrong. When the crowd is chanting, hang Mike Pence, he says, well, maybe our people have it right. Maybe Mike deserves it. Donald Trump embraced the whirlwind on January 6th. He, in his speech at the Ellipse, in his tweets afterwards, uh, in his indifference to the pleas of his family and advisors to do something more, to call them up, he seemed to revel in the chaos and violence that he himself had unleashed. Copy. Clear, we're coming out now, all right? Make a way. We had the footage from inside the Capitol where Hence is rushed down the steps by his uh, Secret Service detail along with his family. To his credit, he did not take the Secret Service advice and leave the Capitol. He stayed, uh, he provided uh, direction to what was going on. He offered the stability at the moment that the president refused to do. Finally, police began to regain control of the Capitol. The Capitol grounds have been secure. Police had to use tear gas. Troops are deployed around the Capitol perimeter to prevent any more violence of what we saw this afternoon. I know you're pain. I know you're hurt. We had an election that was stolen from us. It was a landslide election, and everyone knows it, especially the other side. But you have to go home now. We have to have peace. We have to have law and order. We have to respect our great Now, we brought that to you because President Trump on the tape says to his supporters who are right now conducting an armed insurrection on the U.S. Capitol, he tells them to go home. But I also want to note that in that video, 
He lies about the election being stolen and pours more fuel on the fire. He continues his shameful behavior of lying to his supporters about what happened. It is absolutely disgraceful. I hope they listen to the part and what she said for them to go home. But to be completely frank, uh, there are mixed messages in that video. Uh, and I feel ambivalent about the fact that we even aired it, to be honest, although I certainly understand and support the idea that we did. But the idea that the president is not even capable of saying, please go home. He continues to lie to his supporters. And what I wanted to say before, Abby, is I want people to remember how they feel watching these images of the United States Capitol being taken over uh, and, and this, these clear acts of sedition and violence and terrorism by Trump supporters because there's going to be an attempt to whitewash and pretend this didn't happen. People might attempt to do that, but what we're seeing is pretty clear what is happening. And I think now we have to ask the question, is President Trump capable of leading this country even for the next 13 days? He is inciting violence against the government itself, lawlessness, vandalism, and he's also completely MIA in terms of his principal job, which is to keep this country safe, to protect Americans. Let's not even talk about the fact that we're in, still in the middle of a pandemic. We haven't talked about that today. Yesterday, the deadliest but day of the pandemic so far. This is a president who is not paying attention to the job and is focused on just one thing, which is his own sense of grievance. That video was a disgrace. The idea that today, on the day that Congress intends to count the electoral votes for Joe Biden, who will be the next president of the United States, Donald Trump still refuses to say that he lost a democratically held election in the United States of America is a profound shame. And it makes us a mockery in the world. As we go around the world talking about democracy, we have a president who is inciting violence at the Capitol and won't acknowledge that he lost an election. No, I don't understand how the United States, which regularly objects to elections taking place in other countries, yeah. Pakistan, uh, Russia, uh, Hong Kong, I mean, Taiwan, uh, regularly engages in, in criticism uh, of other countries' elections. What is Senator Hawley or Senator Cruz going to say well, when Vladimir Putin says it's interesting that you, you're faulting us for this because you yourself objected to an election mm -hmm. and you yourself helped inspire an armed insurrection on Capitol Hill. You're exactly right. And the notion of consistency and clarity of message and purpose is unfortunately so far behind us uh, with, with these issues. And we just have to say over and over again, because what we just heard from the president was so, aside from the fact that he said, go home, which was the appropriate thing to say, he said that the election was stolen from us. No, that is what you're seeing on Capitol Hill right now. Exactly. What you're seeing on Capitol Hill right now are people, to quote you, Abby, in his name, going to the Capitol, trying to steal the election for Donald Trump, the election that